Special Agent Cody Banks reporting in for the mission. Please give the d- instructions. <laughs> Just kidding. It's me, Chill Goblin. We like to have fun around here. And who doesn't love movies like Men in Black or The Men Who Stare at Goats or The Men, who, uh, other me- men who did men stuff? Uh, we think that the CIA is so cool and interesting. But as these movies tell us, sometimes the truth can be stranger than fiction. So today, we're going to be going over the top 10 zaniest CIA... Wait, what? This can't be right. The government did this. Like, the government. Are are we sure on that? How sure are we? What's that? I wrote this? True. What's... I'm the only one here? Oh, okay. There's no... Okay. (laughs) Sorry, sorry. I need a second. I need a second. Oh, my God. Wow. Okay. I got to I got to rethink my whole intro. Oh my god. Um The CIA is a horrible organization that should be immediately abolished. I'm not going to say it's the most evil organization currently in existence because that would be unfair to other evil groups like ISIS or the FBI or people who bring acoustic guitars to house parties. It's also just very hard to quantify evil, but I think there is a pretty decent case to be made that it's at least one of the organizations that's caused the most harm to the world. The CIA has toppled democratically elected governments, installed and supported brutal military dictatorships, funneled vast amounts of money from the global south to rich Americans, knowingly lied to citizens of foreign countries, citizens of America, and even American presidents, all the while showing a truly chilling disregard for human life and destroying America's already pretty bad reputation around the world. Don't get the wrong idea though, the CIA was not able to pull all that off because they're crafty or impressive or geniuses of spycraft. Central intelligence, more like central people who, who suck. Got them. Uh, all the rare times the CIA has been successful were always because of their secret spy weapon, being rich. The brute force attack of money, bribery, and coercion have always been a much bigger part of the CIA's strategy than stealth and espionage and intelligence gathering. You could overthrow a few foreign governments too if you had access to basically unlimited U.S. government funds as long as you told them what they wanted to hear, you know? Daddy, can I please borrow $25 million? I promise it's to overthrow communism, please? Yes, the CAA was a British child in that act, though. They're dangerous, evil, and they don't even serve the purpose they were built to, uh, which was to prevent the next Pearl Harbor. But it's important to remember that the CAA is also a complete joke. A joke that kills people, okay, like the Joker, all right? Uh, Let's go over some times the CIA absolutely fumbled the ball. Operation Acoustic Kitty. Just going to include a quick content warning for animal cruelty, so skip to this time code to avoid that. In the 60s, the CIA was having a problem with microphones. They picked up all the noise in the room, not just the person they were supposed to be spying on. The natural world offered an elegant solution in the form of a cat's ear, which was shaped to focus on noise from a certain direction. Instead of, I don't know, making a mechanical device to house the microphone modeled on a cat's ear, they decided to cut out the middleman and put a microphone inside of a cat and then train it to spy for them. That's right, the CIA wanted to train cats. Cat spies, what a whimsical idea. Not whimsical enough to be like a Pixar movie or anything, but I bet DreamWorks would pick it up. Now, could this be the cutest CIA operation ever? No. The process was quite a bit more gruesome than I'm making it sound, and it would never be a good inspiration for a children's movie, no matter how many celebrity voices they got. As Victor Marchetti, assistant to the deputy director of the CIA, recalls, They slit the cat open, put batteries in him, Wired him up. The tail was used as an antenna. They made a monstrosity. They tested him and tested him. They found he would walk off the job when he got hungry. So they put another wire in to override that. It's hard to find a lot of details on this operation because 
documents regarding the Acoustic Kitty operation have been heavily redacted, probably to save the CIA from embarrassment. But it seems that the CIA actually found a way to surgically prevent the cat from getting hungry, which is a horrifyingly cruel idea that I try my best not to think about when my cat wakes me up every morning at 6 a.m. Back to Marchetti. Finally, they're ready. They took it out to a park bench and said, listen to those two guys. Don't listen to anything else, not the birds, no cat or dog, just those two guys. They put him out of the van, and a taxi comes and runs him over. There they were, sitting in the van with all those dials, and the cat was dead. So the cat was immediately killed on its first ever mission, and they called the whole thing off after spending about $20 million on it. Awesome. Imagine being a taxi driver who hits a cat, and then you get out of your car to check on the damage, and you see this Frankenstein Terminator cat, and these wires and audio equipment all over the front of your car. You know, you're looking around, a couple guys in suits are running towards you, and your family never sees you again. Anyway, rest in peace to that cat, uh, an American hero, killed for no reason by CAA incompetence. I have to say, though, if this is the line that they crossed for you, you should probably care a little bit more about uh, Latin Americans. Sakarno Parno. Reading about some of the operations the CAA actually went through with, you get the idea that CIA brainstorm sessions were the types of work environments where your boss says, like, there's no such thing as a bad idea, people. This is a safe space to take risks, be creative, think outside the box, with new ideas for how to kill brown people. So Sakarno was the president of Indonesia at a time when Indonesia was a rising country. He wasn't a communist or anything, but there were a decent amount of actual communists in his country that Sakarno, for some weird reason, wasn't ruthlessly exterminating. Now, this made the CIA upset. So Sukarno was what we might call a Chad president, like JFK or Trudeau Sr. or Idris Deby, the president of Chad. Uh, just a very charismatic, handsome leader known for his extramarital affairs. Uh, to bring him down, the CIA decided to make a fake porn video with him as the star. Now, the Indonesians they already knew about Sakarno's affairs and had different feelings about such things than Americans. The CIA just assumed everyone on Earth had the same puritanical reaction to extramarital sex as Americans did. So this was already a pretty bad idea, but it gets so much worse. So instead of casting someone who looked like Sakarno or was even just uh, Indonesian, they cast a Latino man. Even when they're creating anti-communist propaganda for the CIA, Hollywood still won't cast an Asian man in a leading role. Depending on the source you read, Chicano Sakarno was either in heavy makeup to look more Indonesian, or wearing a latex mask, which sounds incredibly cursed. Uh, the CIA also made sure he was bald because they figured that would have been extra embarrassing for him. Uh, they had him have sex with a blonde airplane stewardess, and they planned to reveal that she was a Russian spy, and Sakarno was thus compromised by communism. Okay, I didn't mention this part yet because it's just so strange, I don't even know what to make of it. Um, so the CIA got two Hollywood guys to direct this secret porno, uh, famous crooner Bing Crosby and Bing Crosby's brother Frank. You would think that they would have gotten someone who made porn, or even just knew the difference between Mexico and Southeast Asia, but apparently someone at the CIA was just like, you know who'd be perfect for this? The guy from White Christmas. Let's get him on the phone. He'll make a porno. He'll make the best porno of them all. Was there a reason for this? Was there a musical number in this uh, porno? Did they want Sicardo to just start crooning? Goes a little something like this. When I'm worried and I can't sleep, I count the amount of communist women who've had sex with me and I fall asleep. What's that? No, I'm Indonesian. Can't you tell from the makeup? I mean, facial features? This amazing story has a sad ending. The film was produced, but never released. Not because it was a bad idea or immoral, but because... The Crosby brothers had failed to make a film that was in any way believable. The Bay of Pigs. Now, this one you've probably heard of, one of the most embarrassing failures in the history of any intelligence organization. 
If you're not familiar with the full story of the Bay of Pigs, are you familiar with Firefest? Because it's basically that, okay? A few American con artists promising a lot of rich people a lot of very untrue things about a Latin American island getting a ton of money as a result of their pure confidence, only instead of a bunch of rich kids suffering the indignity of below average sandwiches, thousands of Cubans and Cuban exiles were killed, wounded, or captured. So first, some quick background. Turns out Americans really didn't like Fidel Castro, the Cuban leader, and wanted to remove him from power by any means necessary. Now, the CIA turned almost all of its attention to overthrowing the government of this small Caribbean island and received copious U.S. government funds to get the job done. So if the Bay of Pigs is the firefest of U.S. foreign policy, and it is, Jake Esterline was one of the guys warning them all along that it was not going to work. He repeatedly begged the CIA to call the invasion off, and when they wouldn't, he begged for more resources. And when he did that, they would just reassure him that they would definitely get right on it, and they'd follow up by not doing anything at all. Uh, Esterline even threatened to quit and was called disloyal and unpatriotic. So that was enough peer pressure for uh, Esterline to stay in the agency for the entire duration of this disaster. Now, when Eisenhower had left office, he had repeatedly said no to a CIA invasion of Cuba. His successor, JFK, though, didn't know that. So Alan Dulles and Bissell at the CIA played the old supply teacher trick on him. Oh, hi, Mr. Kennedy. Um, just so you know, our last teacher, Mr. Eisenhower, he let us have class outside whenever we wanted. Oh, well, if it was okay with Mr. Eisenhower, it's okay with me. And, just so you know, we're allowed to invade Cuba whenever we want. Mr. Eisenhower said so. Knowing that Bissell was about to meet with Kennedy, Esterline urged him to be honest about the state of the mission. He wrote to Bissell, our original concept has now seemed to be unachievable in the face of the controls Castro has instituted. There will not be the internal unrest earlier believed possible, nor will the defences permit the type of strike first planned. Our second concept, 1,500 to 3,000 man force to secure a beach with airstrip, has now also seemed to be unachievable, except as a joint agency slash DOD action. What Astroline meant was that sending these Cuban dissidents alone wasn't going to lead to a successful invasion, and he requested that the Marines be sent instead, or at least as well. Esteline was smarter than Bissell, but definitely not a good person. Uh, while Bissell met with Kennedy, Esterline recounted how stressed he was. I sat there in my office at CIA, and I said, God damn it, I hope Bissell has enough guts to tell John Kennedy what the facts are. <laughs> So that's the most American sentence I've ever read in my life. Bissell, it turns out, did not have the guts that Estradine was praying for. He led the president to believe an invasion at a part of Cuba called the Bay of Pigs was a can't-miss operation. Incidentally, Pigs was a mistranslation in uh, Cuban Spanish. The name of the area, Bahia de los Cochinos, refers to a type of fish common there. Uh, the wildlife, though, wasn't the only thing that the CIA got wrong. From Legacy of Ashes, a history of the CIA, Bissell assured the president that this operation would succeed. The worst that could happen was that the CIA's rebels would confront Castro's forces on the beaches and march on into the mountains. But the terrain at the Bay of Pigs was an impassable tangle of mangrove roots and mud. No one in Washington knew that. The crude survey maps in the CIA's possession suggesting that the swampland would serve as guerrilla country had been drawn in 1895. There were plenty of anti-Castro Cuban exiles living in Miami who the CIA was eager to recruit for the cause, but this made it extremely easy for Castro to embed spies within the CIA. At one point, an FBI agent named George Davis was even able to learn everything about the CIA's plans against Castro simply by chatting up a, a few Cubans in Miami bars and coffee shops. He advised the CIA that their plans were compromised, and knowing this, the CIA made the tough call to cancel the mission. Just kidding, they pretended everything was fine and did nothing about this news. As long as the money kept rolling in, why bother canceling the mission? 
Seeing the disaster that was about to happen in slow motion, Esterline tried desperately to save the mission in various ways. He begged Bissell to at least ensure that Castro's air force was taken out, which Bissell assured him he would do, and then decided to cut the bomber force sent to destroy Castro's air force in half at the last possible minute just because he didn't want to freak out the president. He wanted him to think it was going to be a, a quiet coup. And as a result, only a few of the Cuban planes were destroyed or damaged. Meanwhile, 1,500 Cuban dissidents were already en route to the island. There was no way the mission would succeed. And at this point, even Bissell knew it. Bissell met with the president again at a crucial moment right before the invasion happened, when it still wasn't too late to you know, call it off. But he didn't mention anything about the Bay of Pigs. In his memoirs, his only excuse for not speaking up was his own cowardice. When Esterline found out that Bissell hadn't told Kennedy to cancel the mission, he seriously considered murdering Bissell on the spot. But it was too late to do anything now. On April 17th, the Cuban exiles were arriving at the Bay of Pigs, discovering it was not the clear beach at the foot of the mountains they'd been promised, and Castro's bombers were still around, and they knew they were coming, and they were attacking their ships. They exploded one that was loaded with 3,000 gallons of airplane fuel and caused a mile-high mushroom cloud blast that, to the Cubans being slaughtered on the beach, appeared like an atomic bomb blast. For 60 hours, the CIA's Cubans fought Castro's army, and in the end, around 114 of them were killed, the rest captured, not to mention the Cuban armed forces and uh, the Cuban national militia, who reported over 2,500 killed and wounded. There were also four Americans who died in the Bay of Pigs invasion, and the CIA lied to their families about their deaths, for years. And just like Firefest, when the inevitable disaster finally did strike, Ja Rule was nowhere to be found. Same pigs, different bays. The Bay of Pigs was a humiliating event for the CIA and for America as a country. They had sent 1,000 Cuban exiles to die, uselessly, in Cuba. But this was not the only time the CIA had done this to exiles from communist countries. It was just the only time they were so publicly caught doing it. Let's quickly go through a few examples of this. Starting with the USSR, after World War II, America had little to no idea what was going on with the Soviets. So to remedy this, they collected Ukrainian dissidents, trained them to use parachutes, and sent them beyond the Iron Curtain to gather whatever information they could in what was called Operation Aerodynamic. The Soviets very quickly captured these people, and those who weren't immediately killed were imprisoned, used to feed disinformation to America, uh, used to request that the CIA send more money, more guns, and more people. And uh, this fruitless and tragic operation went on for five whole years, where the CIA both learned nothing and also gave information away freely to their Soviet enemies. Well, that operation obviously worked so well, the CIA had to try it again during the Korean War. In 1952, at least 1,500 Korean dissidents given extremely rushed and inadequate training were dropped into North Korea by parachute or by land. Nearly all of them were killed, captured, missing, or forced to send disinformation back to the CIA through radio messages. And while there was definitely a tragic, unnecessary, and vast loss of Korean life during this operation, I want to note that some opportunistic Koreans actually did pretty well thanks to CIA incompetence. Of the 200 American CIA agents working in Seoul, none of them could actually speak Korean, so they had to recruit some locals. It was eventually discovered that all of the Korean agents, not some, not most, but all, were either working with the communists directly or were just con artists making up reasons for the CIA to send them money and then pocketing it all for themselves. The CIA's pockets were deep enough, it barely noticed all the Koreans it was making rich in exchange for completely made-up intelligence. 
Awesome. Korea fighting. Even after the Bay of Pigs, the strategy of just throwing foreign dissidents into enemy territory was still being used. In Vietnam, Operation Tiger parachuted at least 250 and likely many more South Vietnamese agents into North Vietnam, all of whom were either killed or had been working with North Vietnamese all along. It was later revealed that the deputy chief of Project Tiger, Captain Do Van Tien, was himself a spy for Hanoi. Now, there are many more examples of the CIA using this strategy, which I think is pretty equally stupid and evil. But I think these four should give you a good idea of how they work, without providing any good intelligence and incurring a staggering cost in human life. So why does the CIA keep doing this? I think it's a combination of things. First of all, it doesn't seem like anyone that the CIA cares much about human life and has a very special disregard for non-American human life, which honestly explains a lot about U.S. foreign policy in general. Second, the CIA needs to justify all the money it gets from the U.S. government by doing operations and looking busy. It's like when you're slacking off at work and then your boss walks by and you start shuffling papers to make it look like you're, you know, contributing to the company. Except, instead of shuffling papers, you're sending people to die. The Pigeon Projects. Now, the CIA seems a little bit obsessed with birds, having attempted several operations involving our feathered friends. In 1967, the CIA wanted info on the Soviet flat-twin anti-missile radar, but they couldn't get approval for a mission. So, they decided to teach birds how to do it. They enlisted a red-tailed hawk for this operation, planning to attach it to a camera and train it how to take a picture. Now, the camera they used could only be used to take one picture, so it was important that this bird knew when to click the shutter. Now, they built a wooden model of the flat twin and over a five to six month period, apparently actually trained the bird to fly over it, take the picture and return. So after a semester of photography classes, Agent Hawk was ready for his mission. Except he never got to do it because after spending half a year working with the red-tailed hawk, the CIA realized it was illegal to transport this particular bird and they called it off. I just love how many laws the CIA has just flagrantly broken. You know, American laws, international laws, Nuremberg laws. But when this one came up, they were like, oh shit, the Migratory Bird Act? Oh, no, we cannot fuck with that. Big Bird is too powerful. They will shut us down. So they redid the whole thing with a crow. The crows are actually really smart. And apparently it took them about half the time to train the crow to do the same job as the hawk. Once that was done, though, they realized that the crow, it couldn't fly as far for as long distances as well as the hawk, particularly with a camera strapped to it. And it would have to be carried almost all the way to the site by boat, something that the Russians would easily be able to track. And so the crow uh, spy was also fired right after it completed basic training. These weren't even the only missions involving birds that failed. The CIA also attached a camera to a pigeon and let it loose in Washington, D.C. The pigeon had been trained to return to the release site so that they could uh, look at the photographs it had taken. But two days later, it did return to the site, but this pigeon was walking on the ground. <laughs> All right, it turned out that the camera was much too heavy for its tiny bird body to carry around. The CIA ended up with 48, 48 hours worth of extreme close-up shots of the sidewalk. I'm just going to say it. This is a cool bird. This bird rules. When the CIA was trying to save the Philippines from communism in the 1950s, one of their main operatives was a man named Colonel Edward G. Lansdale. Now, Lansdale did not think much of the Filipino people, considering them a superstitious and easily fooled group. And uh, he thought it would be best to wage psychological warfare against the communist insurgency Hukbalahap group by fabricating supernatural events and creatures. Lansdale flew helicopters with bright searchlights on them and loudspeakers to trick the hooks into thinking they were being watched by the eye of God. He was uh, probably more successful at annoying the sleeping communists who were just trying to get a, you know, good night's sleep. 
Seems like a uh, high-budget summer camp prank, more so than uh, advanced psychological warfare to me, but, you know, to each their own. When that didn't work, he just decided to become an actual Scooby-Doo villain. Lansdale decided to convince the Hooks that they were under attack by a vampire. In the village of Luzon, he had his men spread the rumor that a phoenix Filipino monster called an Asawang was roaming the countryside, thirsting for leftist blood. The CIA actually killed a communist, poked a couple holes in his neck, and then completely drained him of his blood, leaving him to be found by his comrades. Turns out, the real vampire that hungers for the blood of communists was U.S. foreign policy all along. So, did any of these operations have the desired effect? It's hard to say. While the CIA did achieve its mission of stopping the rise of communism in the Philippines for now, uh, I think it was more to do with their other policies, like you know, bribing the Hukbalahap rebels into surrendering by offering them land and money, or bribing Filipino politicians to change the policies that affected this. It really just seems like the CIA is just messing around, you know, spending money on the weird projects for most of the time. And then, you know, at a certain point, they got to be like, all right, guys, we've had our fun with the vampire stuff, but let's just bribe a bunch of these communists and then head home. I got a wife and kids. Come on, these communists will stop if we just give them money. Uh, let's just do what we do. Come on. MK Ultra. A few American GIs were captured in Korea and confessed on camera to illegally using biological weapons on the North Koreans. The CIA, knowing that these confessions were in fact true, decided to claim that the communists must have invented some kind of crazy mind control formula. Yeah, that's it. They brainwashed the Americans into telling lies. And once they'd convinced a few people that the communists had just invented mind control, it became the CIA's job to try and replicate these results themselves. So, they made their bed, now they had to lay in it. Now, the CIA had a long obsession with psychedelic drugs, particularly LSD. The one cool thing about the CIA. At some points, they had the idea that LSD could be used as a kind of truth serum. Now, they'd give it to people and then interrogate them. And it turned out to not be good. Who is this man? Tell us! Dude... Who is this man? Who are you? Who am I? Who are any of us? We all think we're different, but we're all the same, dude. We're all just like, we're all just like, we're all just like cells on the, the giant super organism that is the human race that's just wrapped itself around the world, dude. Like, we think we're different, but we're just cells that dreamed we were individuals. Does that make sense? Like, I don't know if that makes sense, but that makes a lot of sense, right? Like, wow. Like, wow. Wow, I now understand everything. Wow. That makes sense, right? Uh, yeah, no, that, I think that, that, that makes sense. Like, give me some of that. I want, to, I want to get on your level. Agents would slip LSD into each other's drinks without telling them, which is a huge party foul and very unchill move that led to at least one agent jumping out of a window to his death. They experimented on prisoners, drug addicts, and the clients of sex workers, never getting their consent. Almost all of these people were black men. At one point, the CIA wondered if there would be a way to combine LSD with sex as a brainwashing technique. So they set up a few brothels, hired a bunch of escorts, and then got them to slip their clients acid while the CIA watched this through two-way mirrors. This one was called... Ugh. Operation Midnight Climax, and it was, you guessed it, completely useless. There are probably worse ways to be, you know, experimented on by the CIA. Which brings us to McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Yeah, that's right, a little bit of CanCon for you, bud. As a part of the MKUltra brainwashing experiment, the CIA enlisted Canadian psychologist Dr. Ewan Cameron. Dr. Cameron had very little sentimentality for the health and well-being of his own patients, which made him a perfect match for the CIA. In his effort to pioneer a method of mind control for the CIA, Dr. Ewan Cameron conducted truly horrific experiments on his own patients. 
Now, these, of course, involved dosing his patients with LSD and PCP, but also involved copious electroshock treatment and sensory deprivation. Patients were restrained. They had their eyes covered with darkened goggles, their ears plugged, and the lights were turned off, and white noise was pumped into the room for good measure. Patients' arms and legs were put into tubes to prevent them from touching their own body to confirm it was still there. These patients who had just come to Dr. Cameron to be cured of unrelated mental illnesses and, again, who had not volunteered for this, were kept in this condition for up to 35 days, all funded and eagerly overseen by the CIA. Other patients were put into a drug-induced sleep-like state for 20 to 22 hours a day, uh, awakened briefly to eat and use the bathroom. Some endured this for 65 days. And even more terrifying, another group of patients were given the drug Kirare, which induced paralysis. So they weren't asleep, they just couldn't move. The whole time, patients were intentionally blocked off from natural light and put in soundproof rooms so they had no way of keeping track of the passing of days. To stop them from tracking days by mealtimes, Cameron instructed his kitchen staff to mix up the order of meals in the day and also stagger the feeding times in order to completely throw off his patients and make it impossible for them to tell time this way. Dr. Cameron actually wrote with frustration about one patient in particular who, against all odds, was able to successfully maintain a connection with the outside world by listening for the low rumble of a jet flying over the hospital at the same time every day. The CIA bankrolled Cameron's crimes against humanity from 1957 to 1961. The doctor was never able to implant ideas in people's head, brainwash them the way that had been intended. His experiments instead destroyed his patients, regressed them, gave them traumatic amnesia, rendered them blank slates like children. Though the experiments had failed to accomplish what they set out to, the CIA, by this point, knew how to take lemons and make lemonade, and by lemonade, I mean unimaginable suffering. Cameron's brainwashing techniques became official CIA torture protocol. They took away all the weird stuff and streamlined Dr. Cameron's sick experiments into a two-stage torture regime. Stage one, disorient the subject by kidnapping them in the most aggressive and confusing way possible, then subject them to sleep sensory de deprivation with UN's techniques, including electroshock. Step two, create a situation of self-inflicted discomfort where the disoriented subject can end their torture at any time by capitulating to their capture captors. Right-wing torture squads from Honduras were flown into Texas and trained in advanced interrogation techniques by the CIA. Now, these included the brutal electroshock techniques and sensory deprivation used by Dr. Cameron. The torture handbook, printed just one year after Cameron's experiments ended, even goes so far as to credit a number of experiments at McGill University for its section on sleep deprivation. The camera techniques have been used by the CIA-backed regimes in countries all over the world. Guatemala, Iran, the Philippines, Chile, Vietnam. Now, Canadians, we love pointing out what celebrities are from here and what things were invented by us. So to my Canadian viewers, if you ever find yourself enduring this two-step process at a CIA black site, Oh, yeah, are you guys doing the white noise, electroshock? Yes, actually, you know, this was invented by a Canadian? Yeah, pretty cool, eh? Did you know that? Yeah, this and the zipper. When the MK Ultra story leaked, the, the part about Montreal and Dr. Cameron and these patients, it flew completely under the radar. The focus was on the stupidity of the CIA, all the LSD they'd been using, and how they'd somehow spent $65 million on this. That's a lot of money. That's, that's more than three acoustic kitties. I mean, the public response here worked very well for the CIA, who was happy to be thought of as incompetent and wasteful rather than pure evil, which, you know, is not necessarily mutually exclusive, as I think we've gone over. Uh, it was good, you know, that it was this distraction for them. 
in the end, not a single person involved with MKUltra faced any legal consequences. At least the people who were orchestrating it all. The CIA itself is essentially a giant con. A way that a coordinated group of scoundrels have found to keep money flowing in their direction while they look busy meddling in the affairs of foreign countries. I don't want to take anything away from how evil and damaging the CIA has been to the world. The many CIA agents who are frustrated by the CIA's incompetence are in no way my allies. They want to fix the CIA. They want to make the CIA better at the things it attempts. A situation which would likely be even worse for the world than the current one. In fact, I'd like to address any CIA agent who might be watching me right now. Maybe you're a good person. You looked up to the CIA your whole life. You saw how they're portrayed in books, TV shows, movies, comics. I can't really blame you for joining up in the first place. But you have to realize that you're part of a truly awful organization. If you really want to help the world, or even just America, you'd be better off just quitting. Just quit, but before you do, please, all I ask, can you just leak the Bing Crosby, Chicano, Sakarno porno already? I know it's out there. The world is ready. Quit holding out on this, okay? We want the Sakarno Parno. Come on, don't you want to be the deep throat of porn? Think about that. What a, what a title. What a title that would be for you. The deep throat of porn. You know who'd be perfect for this? That white Christmas guy. Let's get him down here. He'll make a porno for us better than any porno you've ever seen. 